to know God, love God, and serve God. We need to know who we are, love one another, and serve and one another. And to be wielding the sword of the Word of God like Jesus Christ did when He was in the wilderness and the devil came to take Him out. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word today. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. I can tell you what I, I have sensed in the spirit world that uh, the spiritual warfare is coming up to another level. The enemy is wanting to kill, steal, and destroy. How many of you know that's John 10.10? 10, great scripture. You ought to write that down in your notes. I'm going to tie my shoe while y'all are turning. I'm going to trip on my shoestring right here. I see. Make sure you get this on video, all right? Well, there's warfare going on. And in this scripture right here, in verse 7, very powerful scripture. Another one that you ought to memorize and know by heart because in these last days the devil wants to make you afraid. He wants you to have fear. He wants you to not be balanced in your thinking. Amen. And he wants you to hate and be offended. He doesn't want you to love. God wants you to live in love, walk in love, love one another. Amen. Come on. Love is the key place that we're supposed to be. In fact, God is love, and we're supposed to be loving God with all of our heart and loving one another. How can you love Him that you can't see if you can't love the person sitting next to you? Amen. So God wants us to learn how to live in love whenever we're living our lives with the love of God. Then God blesses us. But the world wants to keep you out of love, and the devil wants to tempt you to make you break out of love. And the number one, I'm listening, the number one tool of the devil is he wants to get you offended. Amen. He wants to offend you. And he will use people to do that. Have y'all noticed that? Yes. He'll use especially your pastor sometimes. I'll be preaching and the word will offend you. I might not say it exactly right. Or your neighbor or your husband or your wife or your children or your, your co-worker or your boss and the people that are around you, the devil will try to use those people to offend you. Because if he can offend you, he'll get you out of love. But this says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but power of love. And of a sound mind. Read it with me. Let's read together. Go. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Get it in your heart. Another, another interpretation says He has not made you timid. We're a bold. We should not have this timidity and be afraid. We should be militant. You know why? Because there is a true war going on. There's a spiritual war going on. And in some of the Bible studies, some of y'all have been using a book called Strong Man. Looking at the different things that the devil can do. And, and it's really a book on demonology and they're doing a study on it. And I just want to encourage you to read the Bible more than you do that book. Because if all you do is read about demons, you're going to think demons are bigger than God. Come on. It's a good reference book. It's a good tool. It's a good book to use to find out what's going on. But there's a lot of subjective things in there. There's a lot of things the writer writes about his experiences. And some of those experiences, he says, does not line up with what you find in the Scripture. Uh, his experience is okay, but it's subjective. This is not. This is truth. So when you read books and they talk about how big and how bad and what the devil can do, if you don't see him doing it in the Scripture, don't give any faith to it. Amen. Amen. We got a great big God and a little bitty devil. Amen. Say that. We got a great big God and a little bitty devil. He's a defeated foe, but he is a real foe. And if you get in his territory, he will kill and destroy you. Amen. Amen. But don't be afraid. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power. I have power over all the power of the enemy. 
Go with me to Luke chapter 10 real quick. Luke chapter 10. But there is a real devil. And he gets a hold of people. And those people destroy other people under the influence of the wicked one. Think about Hitler. Do you think that was just flesh and blood that accomplished what he did? Or was there principalities and powers and demonic forces involved in the mass murder of what he did? We know there was the slaughter of about six million Jews. But I think in World War II, I, I may be wrong, I think it's like 30 million people died because of that war. 30 million. You know, there's been men on this planet that have killed over 100 million people for their own agenda, their godless agendas, godless agendas, atheist people. Amen. I believe Karl Marx is the one who had slaughtered more people than any other person from the research I was reading last night. In one of the things I was reading, it said something like 262 million people died because of his influence and what he did. That's a lot of people. Amen. That means there's a thief involved. There's a devil involved that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he was an atheist. Now, there's been a lot of people that have died in the name of God. Amen. We, we got to recognize that. They had crusades, and then now they got people doing it by strapping bombs on themselves and doing it in the name of their God and killing people. Extremists. But there's been a whole lot more killed in the name of man than in the name of God. So you ought to go do some stuff. I was doing some study about that. And that made me realize that behind the scene there are some real principalities and powers. There's a real spiritual world and there's a real natural world. But don't be afraid of the one who can kill your body. Because that's all he can get to. Fear the one who can cast your soul into hellfire. Amen? The one you're going to stand before and give an account of all of the things that you've done. But I love this scripture in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Jesus sent out the 70 and says, The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. Now we need to realize that there are demonic things. How many of y'all believe that? There, are, there is a spiritual world and there is a natural world. Amen. Do y'all realize that? And in the spiritual world, there are angels holy, ministering to us, ministering spirits sent to minister to us, the heirs of salvation. There's Gabriel, there's Michael, praise God. There's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen? There's God who is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. The devil cannot be at all places at all times. He's a created being. But there are also fallen angels, demons, devils, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, whatever you want to call them. But these invisible entities influence our lives. How many of y'all realize that? And are always trying to get our eyes off of Jesus and onto something else. And the first place he wants to get is get you offended. Amen. That's right at home, right there. Now he's got a bigger agenda where he wants to see wars and he wants to see mass murder and killing and ethnic cleansing and all of the stuff like you've seen in the Sudan in our lifetime. Where people are killed because they don't believe like other people or look like other people. But we don't want to talk about it anymore. We, we thought that was way back in history. There was more people killed in the 20th century than any other time in the name of war and these kind of things. Amen. But God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. But power. We have power over all of the power of the enemy. Isn't that what it says right here? Listen, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority, or some translations say power, to trample on serpents and scorpions over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
So we've got to get out of fear and get in faith. Do you know what you fear and what you think about and what you meditate on is what you begin to attract to yourself? And what you believe and what you confess, the positive things of God, the promises of God, you believe them and you begin to confess them and do the will, the will of God and the Word of God, you'll begin to attract those things to you. I'd rather have angels around me than demons around me. How about you? So if you're gossiping, murmuring, complaining, griping, hating, guess what you're going to have around you? Amen? Elbow your neighbor and say, wake up. You didn't come to church to sleep. <laughs> come on. If you, if you got to sleep, I know some of y'all maybe stayed. You had to work last night, but some of y'all didn't work last night, and you're still sleeping. So principality got you asleep. Stay, get ready. How many know you got to get ready for church on Saturday? Because if you don't, that Saturday night is going to ruin your, your Sunday morning. Amen. Somebody say, praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Amen. It's all right. It's all right. Turn to your neighbor and say, I love Pastor Mark. Especially after he woke me up. Praise God. He says, behold, I give you authority. I give you this power and this authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means will hurt you. So don't keep telling me the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. Because he's defeated, 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 defeated. You have authority over him in the name of Jesus, and you need to put him in the right place, under your feet, not in your mouth. And when you're talking more about your mountain, talking more about your problems, griping about everything, gossiping about other people, to, you know, talking bad about other people, hating, having prejudice, guess where the devil is? He's in your mouth. And you can't have sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same fountain. You're either one or the other. You're either a thistle or you're a fruit tree that's bringing glory to God. You either got sweet water coming out or you got bitter water coming out. You ever heard this before? If you don't have nothing good to say, don't, don't say nothing. Don't say anything. I wonder how many times our mom ever told us that. Amen? We got to watch the power of our words. There's power in our words. We, with our tongue, we destroy people. And with our tongue, we build people up. We need to get authority over that tongue. Amen? But I love this next scripture because it says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. In what? That you can trample on serpents and scorpions, that you have authority over the devil, that you can cast the devil out. Don't rejoice in that. He says, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. How many his name is written in heaven? Somebody rejoice then. Hallelujah. Now, Here's a good question for some religious people who don't think you can tell if you're going to go to heaven or not before you die. How can you rejoice if you never know if your name's written in heaven? See, some of y'all can't rejoice because you say, well, I'm not sure if I'm actually name's written in heaven. Well, be sure today. Get saved. You say, well, how do you do that? You put your trust in Jesus, not in yourself. You're not saved by good works. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for you. So therefore, you can rejoice. Amen? That's why when I know somebody's put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm preaching their funeral, I can rejoice because I know their name was written in heaven and that I'm going to see them again. And when Jesus comes, He's bringing them with Him. Amen? So you must have to know your name's in heaven for you to be able to rejoice. He just told these old boys, Rejoice! You know why? Not because you can cast out devils and you can trample on them. He said, because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Go with me to Ephesians 6. We're talking about spiritual warfare, natural and spiritual. We're living in a natural world that is influenced totally by the spirit realm. Amen. You know, they have a scripture in, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that says this, first the natural and then the spiritual. But let me tell you something. Do not take that scripture out of context because that's only talking about the physical body. First there is the natural birth and then there is the spiritual birth. First there is the mortal man and then it becomes the immortal man. That's the context of that scripture. But the Bible teaches that everything you see in the natural came from the spirit world first. Amen. 
So when you want to put it in the right context, it's first the spiritual, then manifest in the natural. Y'all want me to prove that to you? That's in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 3. We, it says we know that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Three, three, I mean 11.3. Hebrews 11.3. And that everything that is visible did not come from the visible world, but the invisible world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, I believe it is, the last verse, says we do not look at the things that are seen because the things that are seen are temporary. The things that are not seen are eternal. This whole natural world is going to be folded up like an old cloth and put up, and there's going to be a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. Amen. Who's going to be dwelling there with you? Amen. And me. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, put on, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, let's think again of our first scripture. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. You see how many times it talks about power? As a Christian, as a son and a daughter of God, you have power. And you ought to say, enough with you, devil. I have power to overcome this addiction. I have power to be set free. I have power to get wealth. I have power to be healed. You have power in your life. Say power. power. Don't say power. Say power like you mean it. There's some power in you. The power of God is in you. You have power over all the power of the enemy. Not some. It said over all of the power of the enemy. For God has not given me a spirit of fear but of power. How I many you know that when you're powerful you're not afraid? So we got rid of get rid of this fear and get in faith. He says power, then he says what? Love. Say love. Love, love never fails. Amen. Amen? Love is long suffering. Love endures all things, hopes all things, believes all things. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in good. Amen? Amen. Love. In fact, God is love. And I want to learn how to stay in love. Whenever I start getting in fear, I'm going to start moving out of love. I'll be afraid. You know why some people don't ever fall in love again? Because they've been hurt, they got offended, and they're afraid to open their heart again to someone else to be able to love them. And in fact, when you talk about love, they get offended. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Y'all all right? Amen. But the whole book is about love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Love. Love one another. Perfect love, what? Cast out fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. You see what we're talking about? He says... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the plans, the schemes. The, 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 the devil has a plan to steal, kill, and destroy you, to get you off track. How many of y'all realize that? But you have authority and power over him. So when you read books and you see things going on, do not give the devil more power than he really has over you. In fact, the only power he has is that which you believe him to have over you. So if, you're, if you become superstitious, if you read a lot of books on demonology and, and you, you build a bigger image of the devil, he's going to try to use that to keep you in fear and keep you in bondage. And therefore, you're starting to look everywhere for a devil instead of seeing God everywhere. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. Not see the devil everywhere. I want to see God everywhere. You know where I need to see the devil? Under my feet. Amen. And if I get around you and I see he's in your mouth, I should tell you, you need to get the devil out of your mouth and put him under your feet. Get thee behind me, Satan. I'm tired of looking at you in front of me. You're supposed to be behind me. But the devil has plans, has schemes. And one of the first places we see him really using a man in the scripture 
Like we were talking about Hitler and these other very evil men that destroyed so many people was Nimrod in the book of Genesis. In chapter 10 and 11, in the building of the Tower of Babel. And I've been teaching the last two Sundays stories out of the book of Genesis. So I also want to see this person Nimrod in the book of Genesis and let you see that he became a, a, a world ruler that was doing nothing but oppressing people and trying to turn them away from following the living God. In fact, let's go there. Well, let, let me finish reading this right here. He says, he says, put on the armor of God. So that means there's a battle, right? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Then he goes on and tells you about putting on the armor of God. I'm not going to teach that this morning. Go with me to the book of Genesis now. Now, the first story we saw, uh, Jacob was living too close to the edge. And Dinah got in trouble. And Shechem, you know, got everything he wanted because he was spoiled by his dad. And Hamor did that for him. And next thing you know, Shechem and all of the men of his uh, town, his, his country, were destroyed. Then we looked last week, and we looked about Rebekah and Isaac and uh, Abraham and Eleazar, how, how Abraham said, go get me a wife from the family. And we talked about three things, didn't we? We said relationships should be spiritual first, and you have agape love, and you should be in one accord. How many of y'all remember that from last week? Wasn't that good? Learn something from that. So to have a strong marriage, or if you're going to be married, you should find someone that is spiritually yoked with you. If you're already married and you're not spiritually yoked, then you should be working on that, praying for that to happen. God put you in that person's life to help them become that Christian that God wants them to be. Then we have the soul realm, which is filet, not filet, phileo love. Y'all yeah, laughed about that last week too. Which is friendship in the soul, and you have a great friendship with that, that person. How I many you know if you're going to be married to somebody, you need to be friends with them? It helps a whole lot. Amen? Me and my wife are great friends. She's my best friend. I can trust her. I can open up my soul to her. It's a safe place to be with her. Amen? We can talk about anything. Amen? But in our friendship, we also have Christ, so we can talk about Christ and our calling and our purpose. And then there's the physical part of the relationship, which th that type of love is eros love or sexual. It's intimacy. And that all three of those things need to be working in your life for you to have a healthy relationship. Amen? Because, I mean, you can be best friends and you can be going to church, but if, if you're not physically attracted to each other, you're open to be tempted by somebody else. Somebody say amen. 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 So you, you should be meeting each other's needs in all three areas. Now we talked about that. Now we're going to look at this other story here from the book of Genesis, and we look at chapter 10 and verse 8. Cush begot Nimrod. We, that's who we're talking about, Nimrod. He, and, uh, he, became, uh, he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it was said, like Nimrod, mighty hunter before the Lord. And he began, uh, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And then it says, in the land of Shinar, there's many cities. He began to set up a huge kingdom. And this is where Iraq is today, by the way, my, my friends. This is where Iraq is in Babylon. He was the founder of Babylon. And how many know Babylon throughout the entire scripture is not a good place? Amen. Then we jump on down. And let me just say this. There, there was Noah got off the ark. He had three sons. One of them's name was Ham. Noah, after he got off the ark, what did he do? He planted a vineyard. He harvested the grapes. He made wine. He got drunk, and he went into his tent, and he was naked in his tent. Some of y'all know the story. Ham goes into the tent and exposes his father's nakedness and his drunkenness. Instead of covering him up, he exposes him. How I many you know it's not a good thing to expose other people? 
especially the people you love, you're supposed to cover one another. Husbands and wives should not go talk bad about each other to somebody else. Amen. Amen. You should cover them and love them. Well, this, this man, Ham is the one that exposes, but the other two sons are the one that walk in backwards and they cover. They honor their father. Well, Ham is the father of Cush, and then Cush is the father of Nimrod. So that whole family line after they got off the ark has been a problem. Amen. Amen. And you're going to find out that all of the ethnic groups and all of the tribes and all of the people from all over the earth came from this story right here, from coming off of the ark and then spread throughout the world. Now, you can have biblical history or you can have evolutionary history from other historians that talk about it took 65 billion years for you to get it. Amen. See, that, that's some, some of us are still trapped in, in the Darwinism theory. Y'all still believe in evolution more than creation. How can you? There is no true scientific proof that one species has ever changed into another species. Everything is by design. Amen? And the genetic code is built into everything. You change that code with one thing, it's a different species. Amen? I know we can have little dogs and big dogs, but they're still both dogs. They're still a dog. And it's a genetic dog. Amen? And whenever you try to take something and make it different, like you take a horse and a, a donkey, and you end up with what? A mule. And a mule cannot reproduce. Because you're getting out where you're breaking the genetic code. Why can't it? Because evolution is not a scientific proven fact. It's a theory. Say theory. Okay? Now I'm going to believe... In creation. Because everything I look at says that there's a designer. Look at this flower. Even though it's fake, it came first. It was a real flower. Go look at real flowers. And watch that bumblebee as it hums down and comes over and gets a little bit of pollen to go and pollinate another flower. That's amazing how that just happened because evolution and a big explosion. Isn't that amazing? You ever think about it? You ever caught a white perch and seen how pretty it is? A mallard duck? The way it's designed? How about geese whenever they fly? They fly in the point, and the point one is the strong one. He's in front, and all the ones behind him are honking, ah, 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 because they're cheering him on to go. And whenever he gets tired, he moves all the way to the back, and the next one moves. It's true. They do this. And if one of them gets injured while they're flying, he breaks off, and two always go with him. Or her. I guess evolution just did that. Isn't it amazing? So I don't, I don't want to get too far off on that. But we're challenged to believe the history of the Bible. Archaeologists have proven that there is a Babylon. That there was a Nebuchadnezzar. That there was a Nimrod. That there, and he is also the one that's the founder of, of the city of Nineveh. So, so this is where a lot of the cities of the Old Testament came from was right here. Now look at verse 1 of chapter 11. But again, this Nimrod fella, he was a bad dude. He, he was pulling people away from the plan of God. And then, let, let, let's read right here. Now the whole earth was one language and one speech. Everybody was speaking the same thing and he was leading them all. And if they didn't follow, he was killing them. That's what some historians say. That he would plunder them through with, with spears and, and stand them up so people would see, if you're going to defy me, this is what you're going to become like. Building walls with dead people's bodies to keep others away. Putting fear into the hearts of everyone around them to control Terrorists, terror, putting fear into us. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Now what kind of mind does it take to strap a bomb to yourself and get on a plane with innocent people and blow up those innocent people? 
What kind of mind does it take to strap a bomb to babies, to children, and let the children run out into the troops of, uh, uh, in, into where people are and allow that child to be blown to pieces? Something that's influenced by something else besides this world. Principalities and powers. It always was and it always will be. This is not new. You can see it started... You can see th this Nimrod was the first of the major kind of a, what would I call a terrorists or masterminds of murder and control of people. But everybody had one language and one speech and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and that's Iraq area and they dwelt there. And it says, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks of stone and had asphalt for mortar. Now the old King James says slime for mortar. If you have the old King James. Now here's something to think about. When God builds something, He builds it out of stone. Because stone is not a man-made thing, it's a God-made thing. All of the altars of God were made out of stone. But here is man building something with his own hands, doing it his own way. And, and he is getting away from the plan of God. Okay? Now, so first thing, he's, he gets these followers to come and work for him. Oppressed. Amen? Now, just think about our world today. How, much, how many of us are working for the things of the world instead of for the things of God? We should be working to build the kingdom of God, not just to build our own little kingdoms of this world. And it says, and they said, come let us build a city, a tower, whose top is in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. How many people want to make a name for themselves? Now you go a little bit further, and you find Abraham, who is another line, and it says, God says, I'll make your name great. I'd rather God make my name great than me make a name for myself. So you got to watch that when you're doing things that you don't do it for just selfish motives. You should be doing it for the building of the kingdom of God. So it says we're going to build a city and a tower whose tops are in the heavens. Now when I was studying this, they, they said that they was worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars. So it wasn't like they were going to try to build a tower and reach God. They were worshiping the gods of uh, astrology and, and the stars and the moon and, and uh, the sun, believing that the, they were the gods. So they were idol worshipers at that time. Another writer said this, they were going to build a tower big enough that if God came to judge them with the flood, they could go to the top of the tower and the flood couldn't get them. Sounded good, but, you know, a flood could probably knock down the tower if God wanted to. But the truth is, Nimrod, you know what his name means? Rebellion. The rebellious one. So he was rebelling against God. That was his nature. It was in him to try to lead this whole group of people in a different way. How many of you know you got to watch who you hang around with? You hang around with rebellious people, guess what's going to happen to you? They're going to lead you somewhere. They're going to get you to work on their behalf to build their own little kingdom. And they're going to say, let us make a name for ourselves. Let's see what we can do for ourselves. And they start their own worship. And it says, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. How many know God told them to go all over the earth and spread the gospel and subdue the earth? So they're trying to stay together and build the kingdom. And God's wanting them to spread out and share the kingdom of God and subdue the earth and replenish the earth. So it says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they, have all, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they purpose or imagine, I like the King James that says imagine, nothing that they purpose or imagine to do will be withheld from them. How many of you know that when you get a group of people that really want to do something and they get in one accord, they can accomplish it? How close did Hitler come to accomplishing his goal? Too close, if not by the grace of God. 
not but the courage of men who, desi who desired freedom more than being under the oppression of a dictator. Amen? How many men lost their lives in that war? How many women lost their husbands? How many people died because of that war? But we don't see the war that we're in. Are we going to wait until we have to stand up physically to die before we stand up spiritually and start to pray? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Taking authority over the things that are already infiltrating, destroying our families. What do you think the number one problem is in the world today? Fatherlessness. Not just in America, around the world. Fathers abandoning being the fathers of their children. They're having babies, but they're not fathering those babies. And the generation is coming up, and part of the generation we're looking at right now has no true identity because they don't know who their fathers are. This is a plan of the enemy. Amen. And he's infiltrated even into the government policies and all of the different things that makes it easy, sometimes easier, for, for a, a, a young lady to have that baby and pay for the baby without being married. Now, y'all don't get too real with me, okay? Amen. Amen. There's more uh, single women raising their children right now than any other time in history, than ever. And thank God for you mamas that are doing that, that are laying down your life. And I know there are some dads that are doing it. Single parent homes. But you know what? The pattern is, is to have a father and a mother that come together and they're, they're the covering of those children. And they can, those children can get their identity both from mom and dad. Amen. But the world wants to pull us away from that. You know, don't raise your hand, but think about it. How many of you really got your identity from your father? And how many of y'all don't really know your father? Maybe he was there, but yet he was always working. He was always building. He was building that tower. He was building a name for himself, and you don't really know him. He didn't really instill anything into you, give you true identity in the things of God in all three areas, spiritually, in the soul, and also physically, talents and things you need to accomplish what God's called you to be. we got to get our priorities again. This is a real war that we're in. So what does the Lord do? He says, there's nothing that these men will be withheld for them. If they can imagine it and they get in one accord and they purpose it, he said they're going to, going to accomplish it. So he says, come, let us, there's the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth, and they ceased to build the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And that's where you have all of the tribes and different ethnic groups and different people from all over the world. Amen? Amen. You have the black people that went down into the African area. You had the, the Caucasians, the white people that went up into this area. Then you had the, the uh, Oriental people going to this area. And they must have went according to their tongue. That they could communicate with each other. According to their every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation. And God scattered them over the entire earth. Isn't that what it says? So you can find people where? All over the earth. When Columbus came to America, it was already discovered. Amen? Amen. There were people here already. And then he chose one group of people called the Jews who came out of Abraham, where the story of Abraham comes. Not to make them any more special than anybody else, but they would be the one that God would focus on to bring Jesus into the world. And the first thing he tells Abraham after they scattered abroad, he says, all of the families of the earth, say all of the families. 
So he didn't say, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and just the Jews, and this is going to be just for the Jews. No, he says, Abraham, in you, all of the families of the earth are going to be blessed. They're scattered out right now. He says, but I got a plan to get them all back. And that plan is going to be done through the nation of, of Israel. And Israel comes on down, and then the Messiah is born, Jesus Christ. Which, my friends, we're gonna, I'm going to try to close on this today. Was the greatest event that has ever and will ever take place in all of the universe, in all of history, that God wrapped himself in flesh and became a baby and became a human being and dwelt among us. And we don't understand why. Because he wanted to save this. He could not have let them stay together under Nimrod, under rebellion. He had to cause the rebellion to be stopped. And how was he going to do it? He chose to do it this way and then scatter them out. And that's why you can find in the writings of all of the different tribes and tongues and people, people talk about a great flood somewhere back in their history. It was the same great flood. Now see, our little minds want to say, how do you figure all that out? Science wants to challenge. It, it challenges me sometimes. But I walk by faith and not by sight. Amen? This revelation. Go, go with me to Hebrews in chapter 2 and we're going to close. Y'all getting anything out of this today? Look at verse uh, 6. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. But in, it says, But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you're mindful of him? Well, God loves us. We're always on his mind. What is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? How many know God's taking care of us today? I'm not worried about it. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. How many of you know we need a sound mind? But when you got fear, your mind's not going to be sound. If you got hatred, your mind's not going to be sound. If you don't think you have any power at all, your mind's going to be buffeted. Amen? Because that's where the devil gets you the most, is right between your ears right here. Okay? It says, you made him a man. See? You made man a little lower than the angels. And I've been meditating on this because that word angels, as y'all know, I've told you, is Elohim. It's the same, excuse me, the same word for God. In the beginning, God, Elohim. But they translated it angels. And I've been really med meditating on why did they translate it angels instead of God. Okay? He says, we made him a little lower than the angels. And let me just throw this out there. Angels are not going to die. They are immortal beings. They are celestial and they have immortality. They're going to be thrown in a lake of fire and the Bible says and they're going to be tormented forever. They were created eternal. Not mortal. Not apt to die. God, Elohim, was created eternal. Not apt to die. So he created a man. He created man, but he said, I'm going to make him a little lower than Elohim. And he made us mortal. He made us mortal means apt to die. Now, now listen to this as we keep going. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to come all together for you, I believe. And he says, and he crowned him with glory. And he set him over all the works of his hands. Even though he made us mortal, he put us over all the works of his hands. And I put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjection under him. He has left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels. Same thing. Jesus was made a little lower than Elohim. Why? Because God gave him a mortal body. He gave him a body that could die when he came into this world. Now let me tell you the significance of that of what I believe God showed me. Why is that so significant? Because that's where we learn what love is. 
If we're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love one another, he says not only that, he says, I want you to love someone else like I have loved you. And he said, no greater love is there than this, than a man would lay down his life for another. Now get this. God made you and me, and Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, and he, in a mortal body, so that he could die. So by dying for you and me, he can show all of the universe what real love is, is to deny yourself and to give yourself and your life for somebody else. And unless he would have been made human, mortal, he could have never showed us that. Amen. How many of y'all getting it? I don't want to fly over your head right there. Because we wonder why did God have to become a man? To show us what real love is. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Even when I was an enemy, he died for me. He died in my place. So he was made to be lower than Elohim, than the angels. Because God gave him a real body. And whenever Herod was trying to kill them babies, if they could have got a hold of him, they could have killed him too. Because he was a mortal being. But because he gave his life in love for you and me, God raised him from the dead, never, ever to die again. He says, I am the one who was alive and has died and am alive forevermore. Say forevermore. forevermore. They can't take his life again. He is now totally immoral, immortal. Celestial. Immortal forever. And he said, whoever believes in me gets to have that same immortal life. He, we don't know what we're going to be like, but it says when we see him, we know that we will be like him. We will have the same type body he has. I could, go for, I could start going to some other scriptures to show you. So if you don't have this seed, this seed of life in you, you need to get it today. Come on up, Jacob. Today is the day of salvation. So while all this stuff's going on, you've got the Nimrods, you've got the, the, the terrorists, the Bin Ladens that just want to destroy people's lives. You've got these, these spiritual influences that are trying to destroy us and get us off focus of God, make fear rule in our hearts. We need to stand up against it and say, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And be like the old, the old boys, and whenever, uh, 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 I'll, I'll, who it was that was killing Christians right, right at the beginning, persecutions. Who? Nero? Yeah. They were singing whenever they were going to the grave. They would get in those rings, and when they would let the lions loose, they were singing. They said they would die with a smile on their face, with the glory of God on their face, with, with the joy of the Lord, because in the kingdom of God, there's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And they said, how can they do that by the grace of God filled with the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't you know a lion's fixing to come and tear you to pieces because of your faith in Jesus Christ? That's when it's time not to scream and shout and be angry at God, but you say, here I come, God. And I say this all the time. How many of y'all are really willing to die for the Lord? How many of you are going to live for Him then? See, live that life now that says, I'm going to lay down my life for you, Ronnie. I'm not going to wait, you know. But now I'm going to love you like He loved me. And in doing that, see, when you are truly born again and understand that you no longer live for yourself, but for him who died for you and rose again. Then you become like he is. You know that scripture that says we don't know uh, how we are, but we know that when we see him, we'll be like him. Well, that's really saying right now you need to be like him and love one another the way that he showed love when he was here. Ultimately, it's going to be mortal, eternal, in his presence forever. See, think about someone that you lost, that you love so much, and think that they now have an immortal, glorified body. They're incorruptible, never to die again, like him. 
Just think about it. No telling what that's like. I haven't seen it. I see glimpses of it in the scripture. Amen? But I can tell you, they may have died down here suffering, but there's no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain where they're at right now. Amen? Amen? In fact, all I can say is I just see, it, to me, since it says no flesh and blood is going to inherit the kingdom, but he says flesh and bone, whenever he, he appeared, he says, I'm flesh and bone. I would say he's replaced the blood with glory. Something else flowing through us, life. Because the life in the earth is in the blood. When you pour out your blood, you're gone. But that blood's not what's going to get into heaven because that blood's corruptible down here. So no telling we're going to be some kind of just magnificent God kind of people. Just think mom and dad it looks like. I know you said he was handsome when he was down here. He's good looking now, I tell you that. And whoever it may be, know that they're in his loving hands. He didn't take them. Death came. He's keeping them for you. Praise the Lord. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. But the most important question is, is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? I want to ask you, do you know that if you would die right now that you would go to heaven? Have you really put your faith in the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross for you? It's very simple what the scripture says about being saved. It says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that you shall be saved. So today, why don't you take time to stop right now and ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. Simply pray a prayer like this. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all of my sins. I know that you died on the cross for me, that you was buried and that God raised you from the dead. And today I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I receive forgiveness of my sins today. Thank you for saving me. Now, my friend, if you just prayed that prayer from your heart, that means you are now a son or a daughter of God. Get in a good Bible-believing church. There's several great churches in our community that will serve you. You need to get into the Word of God and grow as a Christian. Don't just stop with that one prayer. Keep on going. And I want to thank you again for watching our broadcast. Remember, God knows everything about you and loves you anyway. Music